Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another episode of Wisdom Chat. Um, one with a slight difference, in so much as um, I have a, a very uh, good guest, uh, Ian Brewer, who is the Financial Inclusion and Business Development Officer with the Bradford District Credit Union. Ian, thank you Hello, so Dennis. much for joining us today. Really appreciate that and welcome. Thanks, yeah, it's good to be, be with you, Phil. Wonderful. Ian, just tell us a little bit about you uh, in so much as, you know, how do, how have you got involved in credit unions? What, what's your journey been like? Right. OK, so we're, um, it's a bit of a checkered history, really. Um, I mean, I come from the South Coast originally and my family emigrated to South Africa when I was um, when I was just seven. Um, I didn't quite settle in South Africa and I, I wanted to be back where my family was. So at a very young age, about 13, I decided that I was going to save my way out of out of South Africa. And I started doing gardening jobs and, and little jobs around the house, earning money until I was 17 and I got enough money to uh, to return back to the UK. Um, and by doing so, it taught me the power of savings. Uh, and the right. the ability to be able to take your own uh, destiny in your hands by by saving your way out of things. Uh, from there, I, I, I went into um, uh, working with the YMCA. I went out to India. Um, I've been many years out there, and then I uh, got an opportunity to work with the British Council in South Africa. So I've got an international community development background. Yeah, um, and I've. Uh, working in um, cross-cultural communication and setting up projects in, in other countries. So when right. we came back to the UK, um, my wife and I, we wanted to live in a multicultural society. So that's why we chose um, Bradford in, in in the north of England. And yes, uh, from there, um, I did some, looked after some, managed some community centres, got into the community side, did a bit of banking with HSBC for seven years before this job finder came up, uh, which is a financial inclusion development officer. And that, for me, that's community development and yeah. financial background combined. Um, I love training. I love teaching people uh, uh, how to look after the finances anyway. So, yes, this, this was an ideal job for me. And uh, the credit union has become a home for me. Right. Well, that's that's brilliant. In I mean, um, a jet setter <laughs> <laughs> wasn't intended to be that way, but yes. no, no, I know. But um, but certainly, I, I know for myself and uh, with my own children. You know, we we talked often about travelling and how travelling broadens the mind. So quite a, a wealth of experience there, I would say. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And in, with regards to your involvement with um, credit unions, I mean, just before we talk about the Bradford District Cre Credit Union, just um, people's perceptions of credit unions vary quite wide, widely from one to another. Um, just tell us a little bit. Give us a sort of an overview or a, a snapshot of the credit union sort of market. In a sense. Well, credit unions are actually worldwide. There is the World Council of Credit Unions based in the US, um, and there are credit unions in um, nearly every country of the world in some form or another. And credit unions come out of a, a cooperative movement. So the, the main tenant of a credit union is a group of people saving together into one pot, and then people can borrow out of that same pot. Um, and credit unions traditionally don't pay interest on their savings, they pay a dividend. Um, so that's a profit of the company is returned back to members, which is really, really important for um, other cultures. So if you're from an Islamic background, for example, you shouldn't take interest on your savings. So we are uh, faith friendly organisations that allow people to, uh, to take a dividend, profit sharing dividend rather than set interest. Um, mm. And a lot of, that appeals to a lot of people. Not not just people from Islamic background, but all faiths that want to save ethically, and yeah. that that there are no external shareholders. 
There are no fat cats at the top of it, yeah. money off it. it it's, it's purely for community um, community benefit. Um, right. And if, if you can think of financial services and where credit unions sit, we actually sit in the preventative side. So uh, one, one of the analogies I like to use, when, when I joined the credit union, I'm thinking, these are two very old fashioned words, credit union. How do you explain what they mean? What do they mean? Uh, and I came up with a graphic, which doesn't work very well on a podcast, but I'll see if I can, let's see if I can explain, explain it. it. If, if you can imagine a cliff edge, a sheer cliff, and, and down below at the bottom of the cliff are ambulances. And the ambulances are, are there to take people away to financial hospital when they fall off the financial cliff. So people come to the end of the resources that they've got, they fall off the financial cliff and then ambulances take them away to places like um, Christians Against Poverty, CAB, Step Change, all these organisations that are there to help people when they yeah. can't, when they've fallen off that financial cliff. What, what credit unions do is we build a fence at the top of the cliff. We stop yeah. people falling over in the first place. And we do that by getting them to a savings habit which builds up their own resources. So they, in hard times, they've got something to fall back on. And also we give them access to low cost credit, which um, many banks and loan societies and places like that wouldn't lend to people because of their credit score. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's a membership organization. It's a savings first approach. We do lending for those people that need need the lending. Yeah. But uh, that, that's roughly what a credit union is. Well, well, thank you for that, Ian. And there's, there's a couple of things that I was just thinking as you were talking. Um, uh, one is to do with um, the whole rise of high cost credit with regards to things like buy now, pay later, or people in um, desperate situations. And, and and I mean that in the, the, the best possible way um, with, with regards to people's circumstances. We're, we're coming up to Christmas. And um, although this podcast might go out after Christmas, but it's a time of year when there are a lot of pressures on people, you yeah, know, indeed. psychologically, relationally and, and and so on. And all the advertising and everything um, sort of focuses on um, particularly things, you know, uh, external uh, things, whether it's you know, uh, celebrating Christmas, whether it's giving presents and things like this and expectations. Um, and so uh, there's also that pressure for people to find other means of borrowing where they can't tap into the mainstream, like the, the banks. So if they're being rejected by a bank, uh, mm -hmm. we've seen a rise in illegal money lending and yeah. the dev devastating effect that has on people's lives. Um, the buy now, pay later, um, which is getting us into a situation where, it, actually, to be quite honest, for some, potentially, could be quite vulnerable because circumstances happen and all of a sudden they can't pay the money back and therefore the interest rate's quite high um, and the possibility of losing whatever it is that they've they've purchased, if it's like furniture or things like this. Absolutely. Um, and so there's a lot of things going on there, isn't there? So that was one thing that I was just thinking of as you were talking. Yeah. And the other, and the yeah. other thing is um, we, we've had as a nation for quite some time um, the the rhetoric, particularly coming from government, but we'd all probably agree with it, that it's good to save. And the government wanting a nation of savers. Um, but we're hearing a lot more about the in-work poverty. So yes, people are working all the hours they can and literally uh, struggling to make ends meet. So the question then often is, so how can somebody save in that situation? And I think well, these, are, these are two challenging areas, aren't they? They are indeed, and, and it's probably good to give a little bit of context there. Yeah. Uh, as I said, from banking background. So, if you if you um, if you want to go and borrow money from your average bank, your average bank lends anywhere from six to twenty percent based on your credit rating. Um, unofficially, 
people reckon that only about 40% can get those rates. 60% have got to go somewhere else. And one of those could be, one of the cheaper options, is a doorstep lender. Now, if you bank and lending between 6 and 20%, your doorstep lenders start around 272% APR. Now, to yeah. put that into context, if you borrowed £500 over just one year at 272% APR, that's £410 of interest. That's a £910 loan for just £500 over one year. Payday lenders, a lot higher, um, and a lot of other lenders are much higher as well. So you've got this big disparity between the people that have got the perfect credit, they can use their banks, and everybody else that has a problem with that. And then, so that's why we're seeing a, a rise of loan sharks. Now, loan sharks operate on all our estates, yeah. but they also operate online. Um, I, the, the typical story I, I, I tell is of somebody who hears about somebody's washing machine broken down and yeah. just go to them and said, look, here's 200 pounds, get your washing machine sorted out. And she said, well, I'm not, I'm not sure that, how do I pay back? He said, no, it's more important to me that you get sorted. And the washing's hanging out on the line. He comes and knocks on the door and he says, I need 150 pounds by the end of the week. He said, I don't have that sort of money. He said, well, uh, I'm going to swear you to secrecy. You can't tell anybody that we're in this arrangement. But if you don't do that, I know where your family live. I know where your kids go to school. You mm. don't want me to bring yeah. the heavies down, do you? So this is where a small amount of money can turn into a huge amount of money. There's no APR attached to it and it's yeah. extorted over a period of time. And we're hearing online now through Facebook and places like that, these loan sharks and people in work are using this. And there's a rise of people you know, earning up to £30,000 using loan sharks because they've got themselves into trouble, because yeah. their credit score has got too low. And then they thought, can't get credit anywhere else. And the only place in the field they can go to is these, these loan sharks. And we do a lot of work with the illegal money lending team here in Bradford. We brought one to Justice in Keithley just, uh, just recently. Yeah. Um, so th there is all that. But just to come back to the savings. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, credit unions are thought of as a poor man's bank. Um, yeah. And uh, and people think it's only for poor people. Well, our, our credit union is actually made up of um, nine, nearly nine and a half thousand people. Nine and a half thousand people. Um, and I just wonder if, if your audience was to take a guess nine and a half thousand people placed in an, in an area like Blackford, in area deprivation, how much would those sort of people save collectively together? I wonder what figure people might put on that. The average figure that I've, you know, when I'm asked that in the real world, people get anywhere between 100,000 and a million pounds, which may sound reasonable. Well, I'm glad you're sitting down today because we actually look after a staggering 7.5 million pounds for wow. just nine and a half thousand people. That's uh, just, just in the Bradford that's, district credit union. Yes, we, we cover yeah. Bradford, Kirk, Kirklees, Bradford and Craven. That, that's our patch. So yeah. across that region, uh, not a, a wealthy area by any extent, we've mm. got nine and a half thousand people saving um, seven seven point five million pounds. Now, a credit union does that because we get people into the savings habit. And that brings me on to some of other community projects, which I'll come on to later. But one of them is called Food Savers, and that's enabling people to save into the credit union where they buy a bag of food through a community pantry. And that's just a pound a week. Now, a pound a week may not sound like very much to you. That's like 50 odd quid in, in a month. But what it does is a gateway because we found a lot of these people are bringing down money that they would have had under the mattress, might have had in a shoebox, and they're bringing it down through our, these community points. We have 14 of these community points called Food Savers, and we've got about 250 people now saving and buying food on a regular basis, and those 250 people have saved nearly £21,000 on their own. It, yeah. It's about behaviour change, but it's also about yes. opportunity 
And it's about giving people a vehicle in which to save. You can ask, you could ask any one of our nine and a half thousand people, do you find it easy to save? None of them would say that they could. And they couldn't say it before they joined the credit union either. But yeah. it's a structure on doing that. Let me tell you one other little thing about banks and savings accounts. Yes. Your average bank encourages you to open a savings account as soon as you open your current account. What happens? People put their £50 or their £25, whatever it is, into their savings account at the beginning of the month. What happens at the end of the month? That money comes back out again because they need it. When they put it into a credit union, it's a separate organisation. You've got to log in. You've got to check your balance. You've got to send it back to your current account. And people tell us that by doing that, at the point that they're about to press withdraw, they go, do I really need this? Or should I leave it there? And that's why we look after 7.5 million pounds, which is 9,500 people, is because those people want to say they've gone into a savings habit, it becomes a bit addictive, and then they want that for rainy data. And that builds yeah. financial resilience, Phil. That's that. That's a very interesting point. We uh, emphasised the the fact that people often believe, uh, you know, I'm not in a position to save. Uh, I, I've got to pay for this and that and the other. And sometimes it takes a fresh pair of eyes to say, actually, you you can, even if it's just a very small amount. And it's the principle of what you're doing. You're creating new behaviour, a new right. habit. And yeah, uh, and I suppose when people then start to see the successes of what they're doing, it then becomes an incentive. It incentivizes them to to keep going with it rather than um, I, I need it now. I mean, there are obviously those occasions where people do actually need it. Things happen. But uh, what you're what you're about is creating new behaviours, new mindsets. We are. Yes. Yeah, and that, that, that's, that's brilliant. So, so just just going back to then the Bradford District Credit Union, you mentioned one of the projects. Tell me some of the other things that um, yeah, your credit union is, is doing within your uh, communities. Oh, one, of, one of the projects that we had was the COVID loan. Um, so very, very soon after COVID um, started, that came out in the March, by the July, Bradford Council had been speaking to their credit union about how to fund people that were furloughed. So we had we were given a sum of money that came from council to give people a package. It was a £450 interest-free loan and a £50 saving starter. And this was to furlough people. And, and we, we knew that there would be an expectation that some of those people may not be able to pay that money back for whatever reason. Well, 70% went on to actually pay back their money. And the great thing about that is that when you borrow through a credit union, we send positive data back to the, um, the credit rating agencies because that builds your credit score. So not yeah. only are these people helped during furlough, but they reported back to us that their credit scores had increased and they were able to do more things because of that. And we, we've heard stories of people coming in bankrupt and leaving the credit union some years later, or not leaving credit union, but going on to getting a mortgage because they yeah. built, they built up that They've borrowed a small amount of money from us. They've been able to build that back up and we've been able to talk them through that process, handhold them through that process. Yeah. Um, and by being a community based bank rather than a, a corporation, you know, we, we have a relationship with our members and happen to build that with that. So it's a very exciting line to be in. From the COVID loan, we went on to do uniform savers. That's helping people save up for school uniforms. Again, funded through public health, the Bradford Council. And people were given an incentive of £100 for saving throughout the year for children's 
school uniforms. And we're looking to launch that again in the new year. Food savings for us is also a major project. Um, as I say, 14 outlets now, um, working with in churches, Judy Thompson over there, uh, incredible organisation that we work with that helps to build these community pantries. I've worked with, um, well, both my wife and I have worked with Julie Thompson with uh, in churches, um, particularly with the uh, with the homeless. Um, yes. So yes, I do. I do understand the the incredible work that they're doing there. Absolutely. Incredible but what, what you say, what you're saying there, um, Ian, in terms of the uh, community involvement, the 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 impact on the community. Uh, I mean. It's a wonderful thing. Um, when I think of you, you said earlier about people's perceptions of credit union being the poor man's bank and and things like this. Um, and I and I think um, if we can somehow dispel people's uh, per wrong perceptions yes. and see this as an opportunity to work with somebody who's not going to judge them, condemn them, um, criticize them, or make them feel um, guilty or ashamed but actually helping to equip them to move forward. Um, that's what we want to achieve, isn't it, at the end of the day? Uh, absolutely yeah. is. And, and that's what we're, we're in it. That's why you do what you do. That's why I do what I do. It, yeah. is, to, is to help people get onto a better financial footing, uh, the yeah. financial education, something much more personalised. But also yeah. you would have told from, from our community projects that they're all co-designed, they're all partnership projects. We don't do this in isolation. We yeah. do it either with a, with, with, a, with a council, with a community organisation, with other funders. Uh, and the whole idea is sitting down together and pooling ideas and saying, what is the problem? Yeah. And how can we solve that problem? And how can we use a credit union and a project built around that to get people into a savings habit and yeah. that's what that's all what we're about people need a vehicle they need a structure to yeah. help them get move from non-saving into a savings habit and then they can borrow from us if they need to from there one one quick question then uh, Ian. On, um, <laughs> um i just think of of companies organizations where people work and um and I know quite a long time ago, and I don't know what the landscape looks like right now, but some credit unions were looking to engage with some organisations to uh, really sort of communicate the work of the credit union among the workforce and encourage use of the credit union through the workforce. So so you, you talk about that not working in isolation. And I just, when you said that, I thought, oh, I do, I remember this. <laughs> It's, it's funny you should say that because actually we, we are partly a, um, we, we do a lot of community work, but yeah. where, where our stability side of the business comes from is our payroll partners. So we have 34 companies that we work with that are payroll partners with us and they offer their staff um, savings and loans via the credit union that comes directly out their wage. It, it's called payroll deduction. So in, on your wage slip, you'd see the credit union and it would be taken out along with your tax, your NI and everything else along with it. A small deduction that's sent to the credit union for them to be able to do that. Now we have 4,000 people that are saving just in that, in that way alone. And those 4,000 people have saved somewhere in the region of three million pounds between them. So it's, it's a very substantial way of doing that. But yes, we're always increasing our payroll partners um, and, and offering that because the workforce financial yeah. um, capability and understanding and well-being is it, really vital because yeah. there is the working poor that you referred to earlier. It, it, yeah. it is a reality. I, I think this actually leads very nicely to, to the next subject of, of financial inclusion. But before I do, um, any any employers listening to this podcast and you're wondering, how can I help my employees? Then please look at the local credit unions. You need to contact your local credit union. Have a chat with them. Because yeah. as Ian's rightly saying, um, there is uh, things that they can do in partnership with you as an employer to support your employees and it and it's a good thing it's a small part that you can play to help bring about um a sort of a healthy uh, financial environment so mm. I, I would encourage i would urge any employer anyone listening uh, to do that but the financial inclusion side so let me just introduce this in a, in a sense that 
uh, we are seeing more and more of the high street banks withdrawing from the high street. Yes. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my my mum lives in the North Yorkshire Dales in the community up there. I won't say where for the, for the sake of uh, it being the public domain, but um, in a market town where the banks all have pulled out. And the assumption is, well, uh, there's an arrangement with the post office, for example, but post offices are pulling out or are closing down. Um, so therefore, there's then that collaboration between, I suppose, your, your local spa shop or your um, WH Smiths, but many of these places don't necessarily have those either. So there's there's more and more people being sort of isolated from being able to access the banking community. Now, this is a big issue, isn't it? The financial inclusion side. And this is something you wanted us to have a, a brief chat about. Just, that, just very say, much so. Um, yeah. Financial inclusion is, is for people that struggle to open up a bank account, uh, to have a bank account on their own, or if they struggle to get low cost credit. So, in other words, the Dorset lenders and beyond that I was talking about earlier. So one of the ways the credit unions done that, and just alluding to what I've already discussed in many ways, is uh, something like the Food Savers Project, because that brings community bank into the community. But it's yeah. not just banking in itself. It is going to get low-cost food and putting a pound of your money automatically into that, plus whatever else money you want to do with that. And then we, we have a debit card system and we also have the post office and different ways of being people being able to withdraw. And there is there is also the internet banking side of it. Um, and, and a vast majority of our people do use that now, of course, because people are used to universal credit and these things like that that is going digital. So we have a mixture of ways of being able to do that. If you are um, digitally included, if, if you understand your, your computer and your internet yeah. banking, then you can do all your banking are online. So with us, we have a smartphone app now. Yeah. You can check your balance, move your money back to your current account at any time. But for those people that are more digitally excluded, we have things like food savers where they can go into the community uh, and being able to save their money through that way. Uh, yeah. Different ways are like that, but it's it's it is it is uh, it, it, it's touching base with your community projects um, and partnership working that I explained earlier. Yeah, it's um, when when I think about this area of financial inclusion, I think about some of the organisations that uh, are very much involved at quite a top level, you know, uh, in terms of lobbying government. So you've got the Financial Inclusion Commission that's yeah, um, yeah. I believe chaired by Chris Pond. Um, and there's a, a lot of work in, you know, keeping this subject in front of government, um, saying it's, it's one thing to make decisions that seemingly look good at that point in time but look at the unintended consequences so for yeah. example the banks pulling pulling out the banks will look at this and say well look we've got to save costs somewhere and uh, footfall is perhaps not as great in certain areas so therefore they just close the bank and then all of a sudden a whole bunch um, you've got organisations like Fair by Design, um, yeah. and again, it sort of comes into um, this sort of area. Fair by Design, sort of led by Martin Kopak, um, known Martin for for a few years, doing excellent work there. Yeah, and um, and, and it's it's just interesting how these different organisations coming from different perspectives are still drawing people's attention to the fact that. There are some people who are not IT savvy or yeah. they don't necessarily have access or they're fearful about it. I have a relative who just doesn't is a technophobe and yeah. doesn't trust it, doesn't trust it in terms of, for example, uh, security, fraud and, and things like this. Mm. Um, so you've got that that element um, and it doesn't matter what you say to them. You'll never sort of change them in that sense. But you can't leave them out. You can't ignore no. them. You you know, um, so so there's an awful a lot in this realm of financial inclusion that yeah, that's indeed. going on that um, we must we mustn't overlook, um, mm. and we we don't want government to overlook either. No, um, the banks are 
um, considering and have been piloting for some time uh, things like bank hubs yes. or banking hubs. Uh, multiple where they, banks. Yeah, uh, and they'll collaborate together um, in terms around to work to man the hub itself. Um, but again, you know, it's not everywhere. And no. um, and if there are communities, I think there's criteria of a certain number within a community before you could actually say apply for a banking hub to be opened up well, with yourselves. But I'm just thinking the credit union side. People are widely. It's, it's, it's easier in one sense if people are city based you know, yeah. a large town base. But what about the rural communities? I mean, how does the credit unions and how does Bradford District Credit Union find working into the rural communities? Because in the areas you cover, you have some rural communities, don't you? We do. And, and this is where, the again, the, the, the food savers roll out is, is, is so important to be able to do that. Um, like, like, like the banks, all financial institutions have uh, are grappling with how to serve these underserved communities in that way. One, one of the problems is that cash is expensive. It's an expensive commodity to bring in. It's an expensive commodity to go and bank elsewhere, um, and it's 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 under threat. Um, uh, you know, we we appreciate that, and we're trying to find different ways around that, and that's partly where our community projects and our co-design work comes in as we try to tackle all these problems going forward. Yeah, no, uh, well, I think the work that you do, Ian, mm -hmm. is, is um, exceptional, and um, I know I, I've, I've been sort of tentatively involved with credit unions on and off over the years. So yes, my, my role at uh, Christians Against Poverty and now my, my role now. And I know you, um, you've got organisations like ABCL that sort of uh, you sort right. of industry lead bodies that are involved in this way. So um, so. As we close um, the um perceptions people have if you think it's a poor man's bank let me assure you it isn't it's for everybody and i so, know wealthy people are as much involved in credit unions as anybody else is yeah, so do. don't let that put you off don't let that be a barrier and if you're living in the the uh, region that um that uh ian's credit union covers in the bradford Which district Kirk kirkley's bradford and craven districts Great. Uh, if you live in that area and you're wondering that you've considered it or you didn't, didn't know anything. Contact the Bradford Credit Union, um, even if it's just for a chat, um, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help uh, answer your questions. Uh, and maybe for you, it might be the best thing that you could do at this point in time. Ian, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate That's, it. Thank you very um, much. If I can just, just on a yeah. last note, if I can direct people to our website, which is www.bdcu.co.uk. That's bdcu.co.uk. If at any point in time you're wondering about um, help and support, uh, then consider the credit unions, and in this case, uh, Bradford District uh, Credit Union. But if you don't don't know your local one, then have a, a, a Google. If you've got you access can. to the internet, Google it. Um, there will be one that will cover your area. So, Ian, thank you so much, and all the very best uh, for the future. Thank you for having me on, Phil. It's a pleasure.